grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Today, Paul talks about identity in Romans chapter 6. Identity is a pretty simple question we're familiar with, right? Who we are, what's most important to us, what makes us who we are. Of course, identity starts with our birth. Yeah, you weren't anybody, right, until you were conceived, and then the rest of the world began to learn who you were after you were born. You can't very well know who you are until you come to grips with where you've come from, and that's why it's so important for Christians, and Lutherans like to throw this phrase around, it's so important for us to remember our baptism. Baptism operates like a door or a portal. Um, it's like a doorway through which we enter into something new, or, you know, I kind of like the idea, a portal through which we're ushered into a new reality. Uh, we come into the kingdom of God by being baptized. The best description of this is the one Jesus uses, being born, born again. Uh, however, thinking of baptism in particular is not only as being born again, but I think thinking of it like a door or a portal helps us to focus on a part of baptism that is sometimes lost. We are baptized into Jesus, baptized into God's kingdom. I mean, I, that's exactly what Jesus says in John chapter 3. No one can see the kingdom of God unless he's born again, born of water and the Spirit. Uh, of course, it's important to make sure that we get the, the basics straight, and baptism is not a magical thing separate from Jesus. What gives it power is that it comes from Jesus, and it connects us to him. Baptism only does something because Jesus, right? And because Jesus has said that it will do something. And, and baptism, and because Jesus tells us, right? He tells us to be baptized into the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. And the point is, we're we're baptized into God's kingdom, and therefore now we are first and foremost citizens of heaven and children of God. Now in Romans chapter 6, Paul talks a lot about sin and death, resurrection and living, and living that life with a new purpose. And that moves us, uh, baptism, the thing that moves us from death to resurrection and living for a purpose is baptism. I mean, it's Jesus who does it, but baptism is kind of the, the door, or the, the, it's the way or the mechanism by which it takes place. Uh, it's, you know, this is a bit of an aside, but that's why I think it's a blessing to have baptism, because it's something we can see. It's something we can, we know when it happened, and we can say that. When, well, when did I become a child of God? Well, official, right there, right at the baptismal font. Um, uh, on... Uh, Unfortunately, lately, we've become too familiar with uh, death for comfort, but thankfully the reason Paul brings up death, and he says it repeatedly in this uh, section of Romans, is because he actually wants to talk about what it means for our life. And here's another reason why it's, it's worthwhile to talk about baptism as a door, because, you know, over doors you often see signs like exit or entrance, and baptism operates as both, really. Baptism means an exit from an old way of living and an entrance into a new way of living. At baptism into God's kingdom, we begin learning a, a new way of life and entering into that. Now, it's not always a straight line, right? We know that we're sinners, which is another reason we need baptism in Jesus. Sometimes it's two steps forward, one step back. We know and shouldn't be overly shocked to find that we've sinned. Uh, we should learn from it and move on, uh, but that's part of the process as well, which is why baptism, we continually return to it, and back to, even more importantly, back we return to Jesus our Lord. Nevertheless, Paul is encouraging us to go forward into life and out of death where God is, and, take a, and to follow where our Lord is leading us. Uh, speaking of death, many people, you know, we're talking about death, and Christians, you, you could say here we have a close encounter with death. Many people have a whole new perspective on life. 
after they've had a, a near-death experience or just a close encounter with death. The first way I think of it is, uh, for instance, someone who served overseas in the military has a, simply has a, a perspective um, that, that I don't have. Um, and especially those who have been in active combat, they just have a different perspective of the world around them and of uh, life and death. And usually, um, it seems to me, maybe I could be corrected, but typically when someone has a close encounter with death, it, it changes them one way or another. Sometimes, unfortunately, without the right support, it can be for the worse. Trauma can drive a, a person to, to drink or to drugs or to despair. However, with the right support, with some resolve and strength of character and with some help from the Lord, sometimes, and maybe, I don't, yeah, I don't know, I guess I don't know, I have any idea on the percentage, but many times, experiencing death up close and personal can, can turn into a, a positive change, a more realistic or um, appreciative attitude about life, about how fragile it is and about how precious it is. Um, when we... To as Christians, as we confess our sins, as we read God's Word, we start to see more and more clearly uh, that we deserve death. Or we see, we're made aware of the fact that the sin in, our, in the world and in our life brings us closer and closer to death. And when we see Jesus' rescue, we realize that uh, how close we've come, but also how good God's grace is and His forgiveness for bringing us out of death and into life. Um, to take it another step, Paul says that having been baptized into Christ also means that we are uh, no, no, that's the one. that we are uh, dead to something. We're uh, alive to sin, but we should start to consider ourselves or we're, we're alive to Christ in Christ but should start to consider ourselves dead to sin. People often say in a relationship, right, that you've probably heard this phrase, you're dead to me. I mean, I think of it mostly in kind of, you know, people being kind of trying to be funny or in a melodramatic, but sometimes the sentiment is real, right? Usually when people say you're dead to me and they, they mean it, it's something to do with betrayal, typically. You've had a close relationship with someone, but then because the hurt is so deep, or because they betrayed you so badly, you, you break off the relationship entirely. They're not dead, but they're dead to you, um, or to somebody else, if we're thinking of someone else. Um, uh, um, perhaps uh, it might be a person who you really trusted, uh, but then learned repeatedly that you couldn't trust. To recovering addicts, it might be the thing that they were addicted to, that they avoid like the plague because of how damaging it was to their lives. Maybe, maybe it's the sports team that you once loved, but they've let you down one too many times. Uh, I suspect we all, to varying degrees, kind of understand what this phrase means, and we, we know that it can, we can adopt that kind of attitude about different things. And that's what Paul tells us, the attitude he wants us to adapt, adopt about sin, that sin is dead to us because uh, we need to shut it out of our life because we've been so disappointed or frustrated or angered uh, by the sin and its effects in our lives. Um, now that we have been baptized into Christ, that's the attitude we need to start to take. Not just, okay, well, I'll try to avoid it or I can, I can play around with it a little bit, uh, but rather I need to cut myself off entirely from this because sin is, after all, trying to kill us. So we might as well treat it as if we were dead to it. Um, Paul tells us that this is one clear-cut case in which we should cut ourselves off entirely. Um, his words are, So you must also consider yourself uh, dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. Let not sin, therefore, reign in your mortal body to make you obey its passions. Do not present your members to sin as instruments for unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life. And your members to God as instruments for righteousness. For sin will have no dominion over you, since you are not under law, but under grace. David, in the Psalms, also has some powerful words that kind of help us, I, th 
think rightly about this. Uh, David says, um, I have a message from God in my heart concerning the sinfulness of the wicked. There is no fear of God before their eyes. In their own eyes, they flatter themselves too much to detect or hate their sin. The words of their mouths are wicked and deceitful. They fail to act wisely or do good. Even on their beds, they plot evil. They commit themselves to a sinful course and do not reject what is wrong. And that's what happens when we fall in love with sin. It's not a a pretty picture that David paints. Uh, In fact, this same thing happens every time we flirt with sin. Um, When we... uh, when we drink or uh, engage in uh, sexual activity we shouldn't, or when we fly off, start to fly off the handle, a sin is a betrayer. It doesn't care really where it leaves us. It just wants to use us up. It may make us feel good for a moment, but it leads to physical pain and emotional pain. It leads us to, to divorce and addiction and abuse and hurtful lies. Sin is a waste. And what's more, it wastes you. Sin simply wants to spit us up and or use us up and spit us out. And sin is, is always settling for less, less uh, than the best. Whatever makes it feel good is, is always a twisting of something that really is good, that God has created. But as Paul tells us, you don't have to fall prey to that because you are dead to that and you've been given something far superior. And perhaps the best motivation is not telling us we shouldn't, but rather focusing on what God has already given us. The love of the Lord sustains us. God's love, we know, we see in the cross, is not self-serving, it's not after power, it's not self-seeking, it's about us. He cares about us and who we are and where we're going. And so he brings us out of death and into life. Why choose death when you're already in a committed, loving relationship with your Creator? Why would you even want anything else? Right? When we, in our, in our better moments, when we realize what God has done for us, we can see how, how silly it is to fall for sin. Don't fall for His twisted temptations. Rather, find your satisfaction in the Lord because God's love for us is, is complete. He laid down His life for us on the cross. And the reason that we've been baptized into His death is so that He might connect us to Him and give us life. He's not trying to stop us or short us out of anything. Rather, He's inviting us to, to find our strength and sustenance in Him, to find forgiveness and salvation and all that we need in Christ our Savior. We have been baptized so that we might live. You know, my sermon title is, We've been baptized into death, but we've been baptized unto life. We've been connected to Jesus in his death, but so that we might have life. Uh, And David, I think, in the the very same psalm, Psalm 36, David, after talking about the character and the, the betraying and failing character of sin, and he contrasts it with the love of the Lord later in the chapter. Your love, O Lord, reaches to the heavens. Your faithfulness to the skies. Your righteousness is like the highest mountains. Your justice like the great deep. You, Lord, preserve both people and animals. How priceless is your unfailing love, O God. People take refuge in the shadow of your wings. They feast on the abundance of your house, and you give them drink from your river of delights. For with you is the fountain of life. And in your, your light, we see light. We remember, we have been baptized into Christ Jesus. We have gone uh, from death to life. We've been baptized into the death of Jesus, but baptized unto life in Christ our Lord as well. In Jesus' name, amen.